Waar die bulgers welig spruit, door een boom sy skaai sprui, soos ons groei en kindigheid, mag u ons vry. Sien ons hoe hier, lei met die hand, laat u sien ons voor ons vry. Strong streams united flow, Africa stands proud and tall. As we learn, we trust, we know, God is in control. Bless us, O Lord, guide us with grace. I'm uh, most humbled to be invited to express the laudatio for Professor Klaus Beiter. Even more humbled when Prof. Beiter mentioned my name as, between brackets, his mentor. There are several models for excellence in mentoring, but I learned how to strive for it mostly from my mentees. I noticed Klaus Beiter for the first time in the library of the University of Antwerp, Belgium, by discovering his monograph, Protection of the Right to Education by International Law. His monumental magnum opus, and one of the outstanding reference works on the right to education. I met Klaus first in persona at the campus of Northwest University, and that just by coincidence in 2018. Prof. Marius Schmidt told me that Professor Barte actually works at the law faculty, which I didn't know back then. And we arranged the first meeting at the sport complex of the university, university campus, both of us immensely excited to personally get to know each other. And that is how significant cooperation started on the multiple challenges and phases of the right to education. Right to education at all levels. It was the start of mutual connivance, complicity, and a profound friendship, the best alibi to meet him on teams every third week. Also on the international scene, Provider has proven to be a sharp observer, an excellent debater with the courage to speak, to speak out, confronting authorities and peers with well underpinned arguments and committed to design critically future scenarios. Academic freedom is his leitmotiv, his passion, as the most prominent service to society. May I add a personal touch? Klaus is correctly ambitious 
and modest in his manners, yet assertive when it comes to academic standards and a person of empathy and dialogue. He's a charming personality with deep roots. For education lawyers, it is an exceptional privilege to count Klaus Beiter among the men of science and experts, leading experts in the disciplines of education rights, education law, and policy. His commitment is, can and shall be considered as an exciting opportunity and a promising reassurance for at least three reasons. Because education is probably the most crucial state responsibility, as mentioned in the historic and decisive judgment in education domain of last century, namely Brown versus Board of Education, 1953, US Supreme Court. Because by strong legal evidence, the right to education has to be ranked among the very first fundamental rights and among the three eternal and imprescriptible rights of man after the right to life. And because SDG 4, the right to inclusive quality education for all their lifelong learning, SDG 4, should be defined in my reading, and rec recently also by Jeffrey Sachs, as the mother SDG, the mother SDG, conditioning the fulfillment of all other SDGs. The involvement of Klaus Beiter in the education human rights domain will be regarded by the international community and the global academia as the most outspoken gift to the sector. Prof. Beiter has already screened throughout his career. Accurately, the high complex agenda of education as a matter of many branches of law, international, national, public and private, just to mention those and of the other human science disciplines. He has developed a blueprint for the right to education agenda for the coming years. And as a legal expert, but also as an ethically inspired person, he expresses his recent indignation on the systemic lack of implementation of the international law on education and the lack of justiciability on failing economic and social systems. At the same time, Klaus embraces the capacity to detect the alternative path. In conclusion, without any doubt, Klaus Barthe will play a considerable role on the international scene as one of the world's leading scholars. He got already in recent times the full appreciation of prominent personalities like, among others, Justice Albi Sachs and Jonathan Jensen. The same from the international relevant stakeholders active in the sector. His commitment goes, therefore, beyond the academia, benefiting people and communities who are subject to the right of education. I'm excited to predict his appointment in 2028 as the next UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Education, the mandate I finally missed myself. It's a privilege for all of us to rely on Klaus Beiter as a colleague and as a friend. Sincere thanks. colleagues, uh, good evening our guests, you are welcome, our uh, honoured guests, Prof. Uh, Klaus Beiter, um, good evening. Um, may you join me here? Namibian born Klaus D. Beiter holds B.U.R.I.S. LLB degrees both obtained with distinction from the University of South Africa, Pretoria, 
and a doctorate in international human rights law, obtained summa cum laude from Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich, Germany. He wrote his thesis on the right to education in international law at the University of Munich and the, the supervision of Prof. Dr. Bruno Simmer, formerly a judge at the International Court of Justice. Since 1998, he is admitted as a legal practitioner of the High Court of Namibia. He was a senior research fellow at the Max Planck Institute for Innovation and Competition in Munich for seven years, before taking a two-year Marie Curie Fellowship at the University of Lincoln in the United Kingdom, carrying out research on academic freedom as a human right. He was an affiliated research fellow of the Max Planck Institute for Innovation and Competition for 10 years until 2022. In 2016, Prof. Bater joined the Faculty of Law of Northwest University in Porches Room as an associate professor. He teaches LLB and LLM modules in intellectual property law, socio-economic rights, and international social justice. His research focuses on the right to education, the right to science, academic and scientific freedom, intellectual property rights, especially copyright law, the extraterritorial application of human rights, law and development, and law and language. He wrote the first English language monograph on the right to education in international law. Martinez Nijhoff, 2006. He is a member of the Consortium for Human Rights Beyond Borders in Heidelberg, an advisor to the Global Right to Education Initiative in London, one of the 16 ambassadors to the Observatory Magna Carta Universitatum in Bologna, and occasionally a consultant to UNESCO. His abstract, universities have undergone a paradig paradigmatic change in the last 30 or 40 years. In the age of neoliberalism, higher education and research have been commercialized. Universities corporatized globally, also in South Africa. Neoliberalism is antithetical to human rights, yet its prevalence in universities is never queried in the light of the accepted human rights protected by international law or equivalent constitutional rights. This lecture seeks on the one hand to speak truth to power, to blur out the emperor, to blur out that the emperor is naked, that universities have left the path of virtue. And on the other, to outline the demands of the human rights approach, especially in South Africa, where the decolonization of universities is high on the agenda. Neoliberal ideology, epitomizing colonial thinking, the human rights approach to universities needs to be installed. Prof. Bates.
Good evening, Madam Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Professor Linda Duplessis, our Executive Dean, Dr. Neil Murray, other office bearers of the NWU, colleagues, friends, family. In preparing for this lecture, I consulted the university's guidelines for inaugural lectures, and they say, it is also an opportunity for the university to market itself. The correct corporate identity PowerPoint template should be chosen <laughs> for the occasion. Now, as you may have expected, I take a critical stance on university branding in my lecture tonight. Hence, I interpreted the guidelines liberally. As you can see, I inserted the NW logo there, and then I asked our secretary, Sarita Mare, to get these very nice vase with flowers for us with purple flowers in them, our university color. Today's lecture is also a tribute to my friend and colleague Gideon Rousseau, with whom I taught intellectual property law since 2016, who died from COVID-related causes in 2021. Gideon was one of the most intellectual persons in academia I knew in South Africa. Intellectuals, as we know, since Frank Ferruri published his book, Where Have All the Intellectuals Gone?, are a scarce species, also in academia. An intellectual and liberal, Gideon was absolutely lost in the corporate university, university system. Today I speak to you, inter alia, as a higher education, science, academic freedom activist, and management must, among us might now think, I wish he had continued with his musicology studies, then he, would just have, <laughs> then he would just have played a Mozart flute concerto. But here you see me uh, taking part in a project of the Scholars at Risk Network, being a NGO based in New York and taking care of academic freedom. I'm also a member of the Observatory Magna Carta Universitatum in Bologna, another NGO promoting academic freedom. And of course, I speak to you as, an, as a person taking seriously my responsibility for the fabric of higher education and science in my country. Paragraph 27 of UNESCO's recommendation concerning the state of higher education teaching personnel of 1997 not only grants academic freedom, but it also grants to academics the freedom and duty to actually express freely their opinion about the institution or system in which they work. Naturally, I'm offering systemic critique, not directed at any particular institution. As it were, we have one of the morally most highly committed university administrators, our DVC, Professor Linda Duplessis, with us here tonight. Humor is always a highly effective instrument in resolving tension between different stakeholders in education. I follow uh, this tweeter called Associate Deans, which makes fun of middle management. <laughs> and uh, uh, you can read it there, making uh, promises about better salaries, and then saying, oops, which day is it? First of April, the dean fooled me again and others which you can have a look at later. And there's also uh, this last one. And um, interestingly, the response at the bottom then is that somebody says, I think actually you are our associate, Dean. <laughs> but first of all, I speak to you as a scholar. And we need to get acquainted with the provisions that we are talking about. So first of all, there's Article 13 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, the right to education. In the first paragraph, it protects the aims of education. And the most important of these is the full development of the, universe, of, uh, the human personality. Now, it should be quite clear that a higher education system 
that is quintessentially directed at contributing to economic growth cannot achieve the full development of the human personality. As Theodore Adorno remarked, there is no right life in the wrong one. Systems shape people and neoliberal systems shape people. Article 13.2c requires higher education to be made equally accessible to all on the basis of capacity. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights had still referred to merit in this regard. Now, merit is a backward-looking criterion. Those of you who have read Michael Sandel's The Tyranny of Merit will know that capacity is a forward-looking criterion because it seeks to give a chance to those who, due to socioeconomic hardship, have been unable, but in principle are able, to excel, to be admitted. At the same time, it needs to be emphasized that capacity is also a criterion for admission. So those that don't have it should not be admitted. And uh, it is a shield against what the German philosopher Julia Niederrümelin uh, calls the academization absurdity. Interestingly, countries such as Germany, the Czech Republic, or Switzerland, which have lower graduate rates, but more people attending technical and vocational education and training, have actually lower youth unemployment rates. Finally, Article 13.2c requires the progressive introduction of higher education. In other words, increases in fees are not acceptable. Not having in place a fair system of bursaries for while study fees still exist are also not acceptable. Moreover, according to Socrates, asking money in exchange for wisdom corrupts the relationship between teacher and student. In higher education, fees are the pivot around which the learner has been recreated as a customer of higher education as a product. Then we've got Article 15.1b of the Covenant, the right to science. And Article 15.1b protects the right to the benefits of scientific progress and its applications. This provision requires states to set up a science system which is functional. Science here always includes the humanities and social sciences. Care must be taken not to interpret benefits too instrumentally. It does not only refer to technology, but also to enhanced enlightenment, or the ability, a la matière zen, to make free choices in life, and the capacity for democracy. But interestingly, there is an Article 15.3, and this protects scientific freedom. In other words, scientific freedom is a part of the right to science. And I find this construction attractive because it makes it clear that scientific freedom or academic freedom is not an anachronism from a bygone era of unaccountability. It makes it clear that academic or scientific freedom rather is a duty. Its purpose is the discovery of the truth, that is, to ensure scientific progress. That scientific progress to which citizens have a right. In other words, Academic freedom enables the right to science. Article 15.1b had for a long time been forgotten. It was only recently that uh, scholars, UNESCO, or the UN Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights started dealing with this provision. And in 2020, a general comment by the committee was adopted, shedding light on this provision. I had written this article in 2019 published in the Israel Law Review to actually influence the drafting of the general comment. And I had uh, various contacts with a committee member drafting the general comment. I had sought to emphasize that, certainly in the university sphere, academic freedom, not science regulation, is the best guarantor of scientific progress. In the article, I also developed a leitmotif for the science sector, that of adequacy for science. It is based on the German law concept of Wissenschaftsadequanz, and it signifies that structures, arrangements, and decisions in the field of science must be such as will be in the best interest of science, 
not those of political, economic, or social usefulness or utility. So to rephrase this, state it differently, the question must be, what does science require to function properly? It should not be, which concrete questions do I want science to solve? Because if that is our approach, we are moving away from disinterested, result-open science towards impact agenda science. The impact approach, in terms of which science must also somehow be useful, favors fashionable and often economic topics and stands in the way of groundbreaking discovery needed to advance humanity. As Einstein supposedly said, if we as researchers already knew what we are doing, we wouldn't call it research, would we? Now compare this uh, with the impact agenda of uh, the South African National Research Foundation or also in the UK, the Research Actions Framework. From 2013 until 15, I was a research fellow in the UK where I, together with Professor Terence Karen, developed uh, this scorecard showing 37 human rights indicators. We tried to measure the strength of protection of academic freedom in the law of European states. We looked at individual academic freedom, university autonomy, self-governance, job security, etc. And countries fared particularly badly in the categories of self-governance and job security. We then ranked states according to their performance. While we found the overall level of compliance to be quite low, you can see the average is at 53%, we found that the UK was the second worst performer. And this is of some significance. The UK has an unwritten constitution. According to Eric Barrent, this does not protect academic freedom as a fundamental right. Academic freedom has always been a matter of practical convention in the UK, not a matter of the law. The absence of constitutional protection has meant that the UK could, in the last 30 or 40 years, implement some of the most far-reaching neoliberal reforms in its university system without any constitutional concerns. Ironically, however, many of the other European states subsequently copied the British reforms, naively, without ever asking or being aware of the fact that their compatibility with constitutional provisions should have been a concern in their countries because the right is protected there. And the same phenomenon may be observed in an even stronger measure for South Africa. For historical reasons, South African universities are based on the British model. In the past, this has meant quite high levels of academic freedom, especially in the English universities. However, like the UK, South Africa introduced neoliberal reforms in higher education and research, inter alia by adopting the Higher Education Act in 1997, which virtually abolishes self-governance in universities. Like many European countries, South Africa simply copied the British reforms, even though our constitution actually does protect a right to further and university education and also a right to academic freedom. The Constitutional Court has only once addressed the right to further education and never the right to academic freedom. This shows the absence of any appreciation in this country for the fact that higher education and research are matters of human rights. In this a paper that you see there, I hold that South African universities are lacking a moral, a human rights compass that they've not yet arrived in the age of constitutional supremacy. On this table about academic job satisfaction, you will see that South Africa fares second worst. There's only one country being worse, and that is the UK. So that maybe actually confirms my theory. This interesting book by Peter Vale and Heather Jacklin actually asks the question, why since apartheid in the South African Academy there has been a shift from critique to subservience, why questions today are governed by technology, management and the idea of markets? But this is not a South African phenomenon, it is a global phenomenon. This welcome study of 2020 
you know, asking quite a number of researchers in many countries, finds that 75% of academic staff finds that their current work environment stifles creativity. Now just ask yourself, what is the effect of this on the right to science, to which citizens have a right? Many books have since addressed this paradigmatic shift from the University of Culture to the University of Excellence, as it has been called. Uh, according to Bill Readings, the University of Excellence really is a corporation. And uh, the question is, why do universities, in the advertising slogans, proclaim to be striving for excellence? What else should they be striving for? <laughs> I mean, the assistant at the petrol station the petrol yogi is also striving for excellence and does not have a web page on which he's proclaiming that. As Cambridge professor Stefan Coulini says, the use of the term actually is to show that a university is buying into the neoliberal narrative of competition rather than cooperation. You may ask yourself, what does it mean to refer to neoliberal reforms or to commercialization? In a forthcoming article, I analyze with colleagues what this means. There are perhaps three components to this. Firstly, higher education and research become private goods. Instead of all student and staff endeavor focusing on holistic search for the truth, transactionalism takes over. The state artificially reduces funding, and this must come from private sources now. So students have to pay fees in exchange for an education product. Private companies and governments order paid contract for which they pay in advance uh, to advance self-interested causes. And capital philanthropists donate money but want something in return in the long run. Secondly, there's the reliance on the business analogy in the management of staff and institutions. Line management replaces the principle of collegiality, that of joint decision making, as postulated by UNESCO. Performance management, output control is implemented. Risk management seeks to avoid the risk of no return on investment and therefore directs funds away from fundamental research or degrees offered in the humanities. And thirdly and finally, higher education and research are instrumentalized towards the overarching goal of economic growth, which supersedes the goals of nurturing civil responsibility in students and pursuing research that tries to find answers to the fundamental questions of humanities. Now this question juxtaposes uh, the two diametrically opposed paradigms we are concerned with, human rights and neoliberalism. The guiding human image of human rights is the homo humanum, the person with dignity, or the homo politicus, the person who seeks to resolve issues through political dialogue, or the homo donator, the person with the propensity to give. The guiding human image of neoliberalism is the homo economicus, a person who constantly strives to invest in themselves, who are to be economically responsibilized through incentives and disincentives. Neoliberalism must not be confused with liberalism. As Michel Foucault reminds us, homo economicus is remarkably unfree because he or she is governed through incentives and disincentives, losing autonomy to make decisions. The science system today relies on performance bonuses, researcher ratings, article subsidies, etc. What these incentives do is to interfere with what Einstein calls the intuition or Einfühlung of the researcher to do what should be done to advance science. Incentives interfere with the inherent reward structure of science. Thus Gupta and David point out that maximum freedom is required for university researchers so that they can follow their curiosity and establish a reputation, seeing that academics are only paid average salaries. Otherwise, they could just as well work in the applied science and RSD industry where they have reduced academic freedom but get paid higher salaries. Remember, more than 50% of researchers actually work in private industry. If you wish to maintain a sphere of fundamental basic research, 
the most crucial aspect universities can offer to researchers is academic freedom. Let's turn to research. And this was the prescribed reading I had distributed in the morning. <laughs> Thereafter, we'll talk about teaching and then university governance. This article of mine, to be published in the next days, addresses what ideal conditions are for research to take place to benefit citizens and the right to science. It also emphasizes that the right to science requires science to be open. The public pays for the articles we write. Hence, they must be able to access them. Yet, most are behind paywalls these days. So what does research require to be adequate? Remember my leitmotif of science adequacy. So first of all, reduced planning. As Arjun Apadurai asks, and now I can't even read what it says there at the back, um, but it is a question uh, turning around uh, the fact that you uh, cannot uh, look for an answer, you know, you cannot do research if um, you already kind of know what you're looking for, yeah? Secondly, reduced bureaucracy. Max Peotz, Nobel laureate, says that creativity in science cannot be planned and bureaucracy kills it. Thirdly, disinterestedness of science, or you can also say the absence of the impact agenda. Robert Merton, whose work I admire, in 1942 wrote his normative structure of science and they emphasizes this aspect of disinterestedness which compares with authoritarianism of industrial science because here the principal can tell you what questions should be researched. Fourthly, open communication and the sharing of findings and data. This is another element of Robert Merton's academic science. Uh, the findings of science are assigned to the community, he calls this communism. And there should be an absence of private property in science. Next point, good research requires time. A group of German scientists postulate in their slow science manifesto that they cannot constantly tell you what their science is about because they simply do not know yet. You know, saying that science, proper science requires time and is difficult to control. And sixth, the ideal of regulation in science should be one where the scientific fraternity actually has the right of self-regulation. And science legislation should be of a modest density. And this slide again summarizes and juxtaposes the positions of human rights and neoliberalism for research. And uh, the second quote here by Roberto Caso actually is interesting because it points out that the researcher, when he writes something, that he always holds the copyright in that, that uh, the copyright never rests with the university because the scientist writes for science. Allow me just to say a few words about commercial publishing. Because at the moment, the scholarly commercial publishers own research and capitalize on publish or punishment, uh, publish, uh, I said it actually correctly, publish or perish uh, to the detriment of science. And on how public funds are siphoned off to a public, public, uh, publication industry that adds little value to research in the digital era. More than 60% of all journals are commercially published. And it is only five companies that publish more than 50% of all papers. And these companies have profit margins of around 40%, more than Apple. You know, and the report by Deutsche Bank says that, frankly, we believe that the commercial publishers are not adding any value to research. And that is because we have got a the public pays thrice model you know, the public pays first for the academic writing the article. It pays a second time because the library buys back the same article which the publisher got for free. And thirdly, universities pay to collecting societies like Dalro for the use of that. And now appreciate that 
Global scientific output grows by 89% per year. Just imagine the amount of money flowing to the commercial publishers. At the same time, in some fields, 90% of research is irreproducible. In some fields of research, such as the humanities, 80% of articles do not receive a single citation. And uh, a recent report on predatory publishing actually finds that it is the policies of states and universities incentivizing publication that is at the root of the problem. So it is state and university science evaluation systems that corrupt science and assist the private capture of public funds, so much for public accountability. German radio reports on how excessive publications have stifled COVID research. There's a tension decay in science. Articles are not cited two years after the publication anymore. The great Philipp Altbach says too much scientific research is published. And Gianfranco Pacchioni in his recent book chose the title The Overproduction of Truth. And interestingly, an article of this year in Nature finds that inter alia, due to publish or perish, the number of breakthroughs in science have decreased. Finally, on research in South Africa, we all know the research output policy of 2015. Now, South Africa has a policy in terms of which articles must be published in so-called accredited journals in order to receive a state subsidy. This subsidy is a large sum of the money out of which researchers must pay the research activities they undertake the conferences they attend. Now, what does that mean? It means that since 2016, I've published 790 pages in so-called non-accredited journals. This would be something like 46 average articles. And it would be, it is a sum of 1,65 million lost to myself as a researcher and a sum of more than 5 million lost to the university just because I chose to publish in the journals which I write for my publication. This research output policy is clearly unconstitutional for many reasons. Let me just mention three. UNESCO actually clearly says that it is the researcher's right to publish in the journal of their own choice. Secondly, this research list relies on indexes prepared by private companies, Clarivate, Scopus. And again, Roberto Caso says that it is an attack on public science to give private companies so much power, evaluative power, in the sphere of the control of quality of science. And thirdly, it is a push towards mediocrity. This is Washington Lee's law journal rankings for international law journals. It shows the top 15 positions. All those marked in yellow do not occur on the South African list of accredited journals. I've published in three on those for which I did not receive a subsidy. Now let's move on to teaching. I've already referred to the fact that there's an obligation under international law to make higher education free. The most outspoken UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Education, Katarina Tomaszewski, in 2006 commented as follows on her official visit to the UK. I find that uh, there is a again, struggle to read it on the back there, that there's a gross violation of the covenant by virtue of the introduction of fees in higher education. And uh, she notices how many people do not know about the covenant. Various countries offer free education or very low cost higher education. Germany, Austria, Norway, Sweden, Finland, France, Spain, Turkey, Uruguay, etc. One might easily object that those countries can afford to do so. But uh, Julian Garzmann actually shows that whether there is free higher education is actually rather a political than an economic choice. He reveals in his study that whether there are study fees or not has much to do with which political parties are in power, when and for how long. But now you might say, well, South Africa is again a totally different case because we are poor, but 7 billion rand is the amount of money South Africa loses annually because multinationals shift profits to tax havens. 
and 0.25 trillion rand is the amount lost due to corruption in this country as a result of the activities of the criminal syndicate running this country. Empirically, it has been shown that fees do something and they recreate the student as a customer of higher education. They create with the student a feeling that they are entitled to a certain product, to a certain degree, for example. Other factors cementing the student as consumer vision are national qualifications frameworks standardizing the higher education product and externally imposed learning outcomes, all clearly directed at satisfying a national and global labor market. And the European Bologna process, of which it has been said that its prime flavor is economic, is a blueprint also for our reforms, which are being copied in South Africa. Empirically, it has been shown that as fees increase, students are solely concerned with the study outcome, and there's a certain apathy in as far as the content of research, of higher education is concerned. Again, some humor, and I'd underestimated how far the screen is away, so you can read these later, but the first one is about, you know, a, a complaint that uh, by, by, by the dean that the lecturer is not uh, replying to emails and then saying, well, uh, you should do better. The students are our customers and they pay for their service. And uh, the second one is about saying that um, I'm not going to prescribe what grades you should give. We don't have bad students on this campus, but you're totally free to give an A or B, you know. And uh, empirical evidence again shows that there is a global great inflation since the neoliberal era. Now some people say, does it make sense as long as, as the relations are correct? But I think it makes a big difference to call a C student an A student. Because a C student leaving the university will say, what do I owe the world? And the A student leaving the world will ask, what does the world owe to me? This slide again summarizes the various positions of human rights versus liberalism in the sphere of teaching. And the second quote there by Ronald Barnett actually says, says that today universities are moving back to their medieval inheritance where university education was more as a preparation for a, vo a vocation. And in his book he says that holistic criticality is not a goal of university education today anymore. So these are things we should think about. And here we have core values of human rights versus neoliberalism. And you see there the aspect of decoloniality under human rights. And as part of this actually multilingualism and also the absence of university rankings. So in as far as multilingual universities are concerned, uh, here we see that uh, John Orman actually says that, he calls it they're the native languages, should also be developed beyond the low order domains. And then he regrets that sociolinguistic enlightenment is totally absent in South Africa. You would find it in minority judgments of the Constitutional Court, judgments by Albi Zaks or Johan Fruenemann. The court as a whole, however, has preferred to focus on narrow conceptions of equity rather than open the avenue for truly multilingual universities. And uh, Mantalo and Wagit nicely explain that the absence of African languages in education, notably also higher education, undermines the possibility of meaningful African knowledge appropriation, because knowledge appropriation happens through language, through a process we call vernacularization. Now we might say, is it not much easier to just have plain English universities? Well, firstly, we can all just go to McDonald's and eat and survive, it's possible. On the other hand, English is okay if we are happy with the fact that this means endorsing the Anglo-American university model, emphasizing competition, markets, and a Western lifestyle. And this slide just shows that international law, actually here the OECD uh, recommendation regarding the education rights of national minorities uh, in the case of languages, does actually require minorities to be taught in the languages, 
inter alia, also in universities. And uh, finally, the category of university rankings. First of all, a bit of humor there. Now, this is something I found on uh, the website of a famous university in Johannesburg, and it is not Witz, uh, where it is said that uh, the university actually is doing great in terms of academic freedom because the positions in global rankings have improved. This argument is strange. Rankings do not measure academic freedom, whether academic freedom is protected. They do not measure if there is self-governance or collegiality. They do not rely on genuine peer review processes, but on metrics and opinion polls. They measure student satisfaction when we know that true learning lies in causing educational discomfort. They do not measure equity of access, fees or multilingualism. They are prepared by private companies seeking a profit with their own agendas. Now there are 17,000 universities worldwide. And I think we could agree they could all be good. What then, FFS, is the purpose of all of them wanting to be among the top 100 or even top 500? Some views on rankings there. You know, and uh, we should perhaps agree with our own Jonathan Janssen, We congratulates Rhodes for deciding not to participate in rankings anymore, that other South African universities should follow suit. And finally, just a few more minutes, then you can go to the bar, <laughs> the sphere of university governance. Human rights require fully independent universities. UNESCO terms this institutional autonomy. Unfortunately, under neoliberalism, that term has been abused to only mean that technical autonomy required by university to be a fully independent actor in the market. However, strategic autonomy has been taken away from universities. Universities cannot independently decide on what their mission is, what they are there for. That has been predetermined by government, namely to meet the needs of the market and promote economic growth. Governments do not openly interfere in universities. More perniciously, they steer from a distance. If audits do not reflect the numbers and output the government expects, graduates, PhDs, articles, it will simply cut funding. Self-governance and collegiality, these are both requirements under UNESCO's uh, recommendation. And they are perhaps the elements uh, most severely violated in the current context. Self-governance requires that academic staff should have the determinant voice in academic matters, but also many strategic issues. It requires that university staff can vote for their rectors and deans and actually also express votes of non-confidence in them. And the requirement of collegiality requires decision-making by all. However, what we see today is uh, that senates have become quite powerless. They are replaced with councils, or at least power now vests and councils, composed of executive managers, academics of sorts, and outsiders. Many deans and rectors are externally appointed, and collegiality has been replaced with line management, which is a perversion of the principle of collegiality. And an interesting phenomenon, some humor is this. Now, the rationale, uh, the rationale for self-governance and collegiality is actually that it should facilitate decisions being taken that are adequate for science, because decisions are taken by scientists. Now, many would say these forms of governance are not very efficient in the current day, but efficiency is an irrelevant criterion for science. Robert Birnbaum says that the real question to ask is not whether we want to make universities more efficient, but whether we want to preserve truly academic institutions. If so, the answer must be at least shared governance. And these so-called inefficiencies, and that you can see in the second quote, are actually necessary as they constitute like essential elements for a system uh, to have resources to develop in the long term. 
Now, it's often said that academia is a black box to outsiders, and outsiders won't understand it. If you bring in outsiders or managers to try and bring order, they will actually destroy the functionality of the system. And the last quote there here by Stefan Collini again is interesting because he says universities now are less efficient than they were 20 years ago because two of the most efficient um, capabilities have been taken away, namely uh, voluntary cooperation, and I can't even read the other one here, uh, individual autonomy, yes. Finally, we are almost there, auditing culture. So, let's speak about auditing culture. There are no quantitative evaluations. There are audits in and of universities. Audits rely on quantified performance measures which staff and institutions must comply with to receive funding, to be promoted, to receive bonuses, to avoid some form of punishment. Michael Power, in his wonderful book on the Audit Society, identifies these two effects of audits. Firstly, there is the decoupling effect. Audit become rituals of verification. Once quantitative measures have been met, this produces a feeling of comfort that quality has actually been achieved. The act, exact opposite may be true. Met numbers on articles, for example, frequently mean that in order to produce more articles, their quality may have had to be compromised. Secondly, there is the colonization effect. Audits penetrate deep into the core of organizational operations in the creation over time of new mentalities. And I do observe how faculty's energies are all consumed to meet numbers and that any discourse about content or meaning disappears. And then there are, many, there, there are many unintended effects of audits. For example, in as far as teaching evaluations is concerned, 40% of staff admit that uh, they actually give better marks in order to receive better evaluation by students. As for research, tips for researchers, hype your work, divide your articles, rather publish four than two, you know? What then is the alternative? The alternative is to move from a system of output control to a system of input control. As it is said here, the proper selection and socialization of academics is actually the right way. And uh, this one is again quite funny here. When we talk, when we talk about the need Ooh. to recruit better faculty, we didn't mean to say that you needed to be better as a faculty member. Our deepest apologies. We know you are as good as you can get. We just need to recruit better faculty in future. Mm -hmm. Despite all these audits, which uh, Max Weber sa says actually destroy the spirit of the Geist of scholarship, it is good to know that there are still what Kian Tomaselli calls the para-academics. They are the people that, you know, are not interested in careers. And they are all a bit subversive and do the little, you know, own things because they believe in them and uh, do not care too much about, about the proper location of the academy. Finally, we should remember that all these neoliberal policies pursued by states actually have their origin often at the global level. There is the OECD, a club of rich states, which has also been called the ministry, the World Ministry of Education, which actually must be seen as the ideological creator of the entrepreneurial university. States have extraterritorial obligations, also under the rights to education and science, which means that as members of these organizations, they must make sure that the policies they adopt do not violate rights to education and science in countries around the world. So could we then say that the modern university is only marginally concerned with gaining knowledge, that it is a publication factory, a fundraising institution managed by CEOs, 
and that money has systematically replaced thought? Well, the emperor seems to be naked, which means it is time to rebuild moral universities in the, lights, in the light of the rights to education and science of international law. Now, here we are. It remains for me to thank a few people who've played an important role in me becoming the personal academic I am. And I start with the professors of the University of South Africa at the time, great minds such as professors Andre van der Walt, Johan Nietling, Marinus Wiegers, which instilled in me a passion for the law. I thank my doctor father at the University of Munich, Bruno Zimmer, for having instilled in me a passion for international human rights law and for having inspired the writing uh, of this book. And actually, this is the copy that I gave to Richard, who's going to speak in a few minutes. And uh, I gave it to him in 2006, and he gave it to me back today and says he's finally finished reading it. <laughs> you know? I would like to thank Professor Reto Hilti from the Max Planck Institute in Munich for having created a space there for me to become also a scholar on intellectual property law. I thank Professor Terence Caron from the University of Lincoln in the UK because without him, the Marie Curie endeavor would never have materialized and my career as a researcher or academic would not have been kick-started. I thank the Northwest University, which has always been kind to me. I thank our faculty dean, because she has undertaken to always create a space for me as a researcher in the faculty, and also for hosting tonight's event. I thank all my colleagues, who've always remained kind in this what is a tough job, I thank all people that I've invited to this occasion, here in the room and online, because I've very specifically invited you because you've played some role in my private or my academic life. And then I should also say, it's improper to say, or to express thanks in this regard, but I acknowledge white privilege. I was born during apartheid. If I'd been born a black person, I would probably look after your car and the parking space in the mall. Finally, it remains for me to thank family and friends, Richard, for coming here, and of course, in particular, also to me. What has my mother given to me? She knows she's going to do a speech now. <laughs> what has my mother given to me? I said earlier on that there is the homo donator, the person with the propensity to give. And that is my mother. So I guess I've got a, at least a bit of that. Last year, a student in a student evaluation actually wrote, we call him Santa Claus because he, <laughs> because he keeps on giving. Yeah. And uh, what has my father given me? My father is a non-conformist, independent in his thinking, and has always just pursued the road that he thought is correct, and that has always been like an ideal for me. Thank you very much. Good evening, colleagues, Dr. Nayu and Professor Weiter. It's my privilege to congratulate you on behalf of this Northwest University on this milestone in your career. And congratulations on a very thought-provoking lecture. This is indeed the highest promotion that you can achieve at a university. And an event like this is a reason for celebration, but it's also an inspiration to your colleagues, your students, and your success is also the success of all the people you mentioned tonight that inspired you to be here today. I have to admit, I've attended many inaugural lectures, but I did not know that we have guidelines on these events. 
So I guess it took someone from the Faculty of Law to disclose those guidelines. And uh, the purple flowers, I do think they add to the brand value. <laughs> this is also the first inaugural lecture where I almost feel like I have to apologize because I'm responsible for submitting all the numbers of the university to the Department of Higher Education. But I believe that this can be done in a way so not as to infringe on the work and the freedom of our researchers. Um, I do take serious your request to have a space for academic leaders that give people the personal assurance that they can work in a space of academic freedom, and as you called it, to be a facilitator and not a manager. I also agree that one, not, one can never um, attach a price tag to wisdom. But Professor Weiter, we also know that in an event like this, we see the tip of the iceberg. But when reading your CV, we see the much larger bottom of the iceberg, the different roles you occupied, the international networks you've formed, the funding you received, as well as the impact of your work. And I would li like to think that with being a full professor actually comes more academic freedom because you now have an authoritative voice. And we need professionals to contribute to the vision, to the direction and the success of universities of the future. Jonathan Janssen also said, a university ceases to exist when the intellectual project no longer defines its identity, infuses its curricula, energizes its scholars, and inspires its students. So, Klaus, thank you for reminding us to speak truth to power and the, recognize the need to keep on aligning our universities with human rights. We are glad that you chose the Northwest University as the place to do your research, and I hope you will keep on doing that, and that your work will assist us as a university to create a safe environment for academic freedoms, and I hope we do not regress to medi mediocrity. Congratulations. will now be the closing done by, by Richard. After that, we can all stand for the singing of the national anthem. And after that, Professor Beiter will have the privilege of leading the uh, procession out. And you can be at the door for, for congratulatory messages. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Hoi Aand. It really is a great pleasure for me to be part of Professor Klaus Beiter's inaugural lecture and also to be offered an opportunity to give some closing words on this special occasion. Klaus and I go back many years. We were best friends at school from sub A all the way until matric. And although our life's journeys have gone different ways after leaving school, whenever we meet up, or whenever we phone each other, it's as if no time has passed at all. Klaus has always excelled academically. And in fact, I think it is safe for me to say that throughout our school career, we've always had a tiny bit of academic rivalry. I remember in high school, there used to be an event called the speech competition, which we both participated in. And Klaus, being the very confident speaker that he is, always walked away with the winning trophy, except for one year. Remember, Klaus? <laughs> <laughs> I could recall many stories of our past, some sad, some serious, but as I reflected on our past history, it occurred to me that the overwhelming majority of memories are those of us having fun together. Yes, we laughed a lot and I really, really cherish those memories. And today is another day I will really cherish. It would be wrong for me to say that I know how hard it was for Klaus to become a professor, but the reality is I do not know what it takes to become a professor. What I do know is that Klaus's journey started a long time ago, throughout school, throughout his studies, He's worked diligently and consistently. He always takes pride in his work, 
and really strives for excellence. I would like to end tonight with a quote. Because every good speech, like every good piece of writing, deserves a quote. In fact, I remember in high school when we were the editors of the school's magazine, with every edition that was published, we put in many, many quotes from famous philosophers and famous people. And in fact, I think in the entire history of, this, of the school's magazine, it was never filled with so much wisdom. And so within the context of Klaus being a university professor and his, his speech referring to the rights to education, I found the following quote. It is the supreme art of the teacher to awaken joy in creative expression and knowledge. I will read it again. It is the supreme art of the teacher to awaken joy in creative expression and knowledge. And this quote is attributed to none other than Albert Einstein himself. And interestingly, I noticed that Albert Einstein was referenced twice in Clausen's inaugural lecture, <laughs> at least twice. Klaus, it is my wish for you that you continue to awaken joy in your academic pursuits, not only in yourself, but also in your students, your colleagues, and in everybody that you encounter. I must say I'm extremely proud and really, really happy of your accomplishment. Well done. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, I've been asked to instruct you to go to the sunset room, which I believe is where the light is. So. <laughs> Just follow the light and I'm sure you'll, you'll go right. Thank you.